What's up everybody, welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony, let's jump in. Happy Saturday everybody, I hope you're getting some rest this weekend. First up, let's talk about the continuing technology and financial decoupling between the United States and China. This week, we have seen the U.S. introduce a new series of restrictions that will hit many Chinese companies hard. At the start of the week, the Financial Times reported that the U.S. was set to blacklist eight more Chinese companies, including famous drone maker DJI. U.S. sources expressed that the motivation behind the blacklist is to bar U.S. investors from taking stakes in groups accused of involvement in Xinjiang abuses according to the Financial Times. The new blacklist was made official on Thursday. Other companies included Cloudwalk Technology, a facial recognition software company, Xiamen Meiya Pico, a cybersecurity group, NetPulsar Technologies, a producer of cloud-based surveillance systems, and Dawning Information Industry, a supercomputer manufacturer and cloud computing services operator in Xinjiang. Also on Thursday, the U.S. announced that it is placing China's Academy of Military Medical Sciences and 11 other institutes involved in biotechnology on an export blacklist. The Commerce Department will place these institutions on what is called an entry list, which basically prohibits U.S. companies from sending or exporting U.S. originated technology to the companies on the list. The Financial Times, also reporting on the story, said that a senior official told them, quote, The institutes were using biotech to help the Chinese military develop applications that included brain control weaponry, end quote. On Thursday, too, the U.S. National Security Council held a meeting to discuss a proposal which, if adopted, would tighten the rules on exports to Shanghai-based Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp, or SMIC, China's largest chipmaker. Such a move would be a very big deal indeed and cause a lot of disruptions for Beijing's semiconductor plans, plans and strategies that we've been following here for the last 12 months. Companies such as Applied Materials Inc., KLA Corp., and LAM Research Corp. may find their ability to sell to Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corp. severely limited. Again, also on Thursday, Thursday was a big day, uh, apparently, the U.S. Senate unanimously passed a bill which would crack down on the PRC actions in Xinjiang. The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which effectively bans all imports from China's Xinjiang region, has been sent to U.S. President Joe Biden's desk for his signature. Okay, next up, this newest outbreak is proving to be very stubborn indeed, with dozens of cases and now well over 100 cases sprouting up in major industrial hubs in eastern and southern China every day, causing serious economic and logistical disruptions and resulting in almost 700,000 people in centralized quarantine. Like I've said in previous episodes again and again, even though a few hundred a day or a few hundred over a few days does not sound like many, if you're from, say, North America or other places, because of China's zero tolerance or zero cases policy, even the discovery of one case can involve very expensive disruptions. On Wednesday in the southern city of Dongguan, near Shenzhen and Hong Kong, the local government launched mass testing of the city's 10.5 million people after four infections were found the day before. Local cases are also being discovered every day in Guangdong in the south, Shanxi in the west, Inner Mongolia or Neimanggu in the north, and Anhui and Zhejiang in the east of the country. A few hours ago as I write this, China's health authority reported that yesterday the number of COVID cases discovered, uh, on this is on Friday, had tripled over the day before. The government is now trying to keep people at home as the country moves closer to the Chinese Spring Festival holiday period, which typically sees hundreds of millions of people moving around the country. In 2022, this holiday period falls between January 31st and February the 6th. Both the carrot and the stick have been employed, with some companies uh, offering cash and other benefits for workers who stay. 
and local governments implementing strict travel restrictions to reduce mobility. Hey, by the way, guys, if you enjoyed the video, please hit that like button. It's the only way a small channel like this can be seen by more people. And if you're getting some value from this information, from this analysis, maybe consider subscribing, hit that bell notification, and you'll have the most up-to-date China analysis as I release it every day. Okay, back into it. Expect prices of lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles to increase as large numbers of the producers of cobalt, a key component, have been suspended, uh, their operations rather, have been suspended in Zhejiang province. At a virtual forum on Thursday, Professor Zhao Kejin, an expert on China's foreign policy at Tsinghua University in Beijing, warned that China's restrictions on international travel could compromise efforts to foster closer diplomatic ties with major trading partners and recommended that China consider easing its border policy. His voice is still very much in the minority, however, my feeling is that there is still very little appetite among top leadership in Beijing to ease China's border policy. This week too, we've seen more evidence to be concerned with the effectiveness of China's Sinovac vaccine, which has been given to over 1 billion Chinese citizens against newer strains of the virus. According to a study accepted for publication in the Journal of Clinical Infectious Diseases, Researchers in Hong Kong have found that insufficient antibodies were generated by Sinovac to defend against Omicron. Several high-profile health experts in China have warned in recent weeks that this may indeed be the case. Okay, last up, let's talk about the housing crisis. Evergrande, Shimao, and the other developers we've been keeping an eye on. Uh, in, in, during this crisis. In yesterday's uh, China update, we discussed the very poor uh, data that was released this week for the Chinese housing sector, which showed that new home prices dropped 0.33% in November from October across 70 cities that were surveyed, the biggest month-on-month -month decline in six years. New construction starts, as measured by floor area, plunged 21% year-on-year November 2, down for the eighth month in a row, and the actual value of home sales collapsed by 16.3% in what was a fifth straight month of decline. Check out yesterday's video for my deep dive into what this data means for China's housing crisis. Now, some Investors are still very bullish on China's housing market, however, and are willing to put their money where their mouth is. Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post reports that Singapore's uh, $744 billion US dollar sovereign wealth fund this week expressed that it, quote, sees potential opportunities to do deals and buy debt in China's battered real estate sector, end quote. Confident Beijing, quote, won't let things spiral out of control, end quote. According to the chief executive officer of GIC, Singapore's sovereign wealth fund, Lim Chao Kiat, quote, We continue to have confidence that it is a good investment market for us. We are not moving away from being involved in the Chinese real estate market, end quote. The wealth fund is thus betting that Beijing will resuscitate the Chinese property sector. As you guys know, we've been following Chinese property developer Shimao Group Holdings this week. On Friday, ratings agencies Moody's and Finch both downgraded Shimao Group by two notches due to, quote, the Chinese developers increased financial risks, end quote. In a statement, Moody's expressed, quote, the rating downgrade reflects Shimao's increased refinancing risk due to its constrained funding access and sizable debt maturities over the next 6 to 12 months, end quote. According to the ratings agency, next year, Shimao has uh, 1.7 billion US dollars in offshore and 1.4 billion US dollars in onshore obligations to meet. The downgrades could trigger some creditors to demand immediate repayment, further pressuring liquidity issues. However, there are mixed reports in the mainland that Shimao may be receiving government support and the company announced on Thursday that it can meet its Q4 financial obligations, causing a modest price rally for the company in equity markets after a week of prices collapsing to their lowest levels in a decade. Yesterday, Reuters reported that Shimao's biggest creditor, uh, China, Merchants, uh, China Merchants Bank, plans to increase its loan exposure to the troubled developer. 
Meanwhile, also on Friday, S&P downgraded China Evergrande Group to quote-unquote selective default. Finch already downgraded Evergrande to restricted default a few days ago, which we covered at the time. The developer is now at real risk of becoming China's biggest developer in its history. Moody's and Finch downgraded Guangzhou, R&F properties to B3 and B- respectively. We discussed this troubled property developer on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. Just one of several Chinese property developers that we need to follow as they're facing a debt crisis and a liquidity crunch. Hey guys, I'd love to hear what you thought about some of the updates we covered in today's episode. So throw your comments below. Always love hearing from you. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.